Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Great, I've got a thumbs up from Lisa, that's good. I'll just make great. sure my chat's open. Hello, oh great, fantastic. Hi everyone, wow, there is so many of you. It's actually so amazing. This is literally the biggest audience we've had and it's so cool, I can't believe it. Um, it's So welcome to our event. This is the first of our DVIP Speakers Corners which is a really exciting new series of talks we've got, which is part of our Archaeology at Home project. So we'll be ripping our topics straight from the headlines. Stay tuned, there's loads more to come. And we're really going to try and stay up a couple of the times. I'll talk a little bit more about Archaeology at Home, but you know that normally we bring you to the Archaeology. Anyone who knows Dig Ventures knows that we love sharing it with people, and unfortunately we can't do that at the minute. So what we really want to do with this project is bring the Archaeology to you. So hopefully tonight will be the start of an amazing new thing that we've got going. Anyone who hasn't been to our events before or hasn't seen me before, my name is Ginny and I work at Dig Ventures. Tonight I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Lisa and Maya, who are going to be helping me to introduce Martin Carver. It's so exciting. We're all really looking forward to hearing what he has to say about Sutton Who, which is really up there at the minute with the dig that's just come out. But before we kick off with that, I'm just going to share my screen quickly and go through a little bit of housekeeping. Bear with me. So you should all be able to see my screen now. Maya, can you give me a thumbs up if that's what it? Fantastic. So let's just go through a couple of things before we get started. You'll notice that this Zoom is set up as a meeting. But a lot of you have already pointed out that you can't use your microphone or camera. Don't worry, your computer is not broken. We've done that just to make sure that everyone's internet is working fine and isn't too stretched out and that we can all hear each other clearly. You'll also notice if you've been to our Zooms before, you might have noticed that we've upgraded it slightly. So there are a few new features, such as the reactions button. So you should see that along the bottom of your screen. So you'll have a few different options there. I can see some people have already utilized them. You can <laughs> throw hearts out there, celebrations, but it's also really practical because you can tell us when we might need to slow down or speed up. So feel free to use those and stay in touch with us. You'll also see the chat on the right hand side of your screen. You've been using that already, which is fantastic. Continue to use that if you'd like, throw any comments in there. We encourage friendly debate. We wanna hear from you all. And that is where we're gonna hold a Q&A later. So if at any point you have any questions, feel free to pop them in there. But if you could, can you write Q&A before them for us? Just so we can identify which ones are the questions and we'll save them up and then ask them later. If the chat becomes annoying at any point or it's distracting you, do feel free to close it off though. So keep, remember, when we're using the chat, we're going to keep it friendly. And tonight, we actually have Maggie is here. She is our big bouncer. She's scary and she's ready to throw people out if they're mean. So she's got like her fingers who's itching on those buttons. So remember to be all nice to each other. We're all like-minded. We're all here to see some great archaeology. So let's keep it nice. No mean comments, please. We don't want to have to throw anyone out. Never happened before, but I feel like I have to say it every time just in case. Uh, please be patient with us. Zoom is a very new feature in all of our lives, so sometimes things can go a little bit wrong on the technical side of things or audio or visuals might be a bit fuzzy. If that happens, do give us a couple of minutes and we'll try and fix that as quickly as possible. But please be patient with us because we're just as new to it as you all are as well. And finally, my last housekeeping point, this presentation does include images and discussions of human remains. If that's something you'd rather not see, don't worry, no pressure. There should be enough warning beforehand that you can turn off your sound or your screen if you'd like to before that happens. So next up, I'm gonna go quickly through our order of events. So of course, we're kicking off this welcome that I'm doing. I promise I'll be done in a few minutes and we're gonna take up too much of your time. After that, we're gonna move on to a short introduction. Who is Martin Carver, our speaker tonight? And Lisa's gonna head that before we go into our main discussion. We're gonna talk all about certain who, the amazing archeology span there and reflect upon what that history means in the here and now, which is really cool. After that, we'll have a bit of a Q and A. Like I said, you can drop questions in the chat. So we'll get to those burning questions for you. Try and answer as many as we can. 
And you'll notice my next point is actually really exciting. So tonight we have a very special announcement. It's going to be big. We haven't shared this with anyone but our subscribers yet, but we thought tonight was a night to share it with you. So if you're really intrigued by that, do hang around because honestly, it will be worth the wait. And I am just so excited to show you all. I'm sure Lisa and Maya is as well. And then of course, at the end, <laughs> I've got a big nod from Myla. <laughs> at the end as well, we'll say our goodbyes and we're gonna give you further resources as well. So if you wanna check out any of Martin's work or if you wanna watch back the recording, anything like that, we'll show you how we're gonna link you to that. And so you'll be able to catch up with it and reflect on this again in future and go deeper and deeper into the dig. A few more things before we start. I just wanna say a big thank you to the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So it's their funding that's making archaeology at home possible. And it's going to be an amazing series of events, like I said, all over the summer. Loads of different things. Do keep your eye out for it. But a big thank you to them. And of course, a big thank you to our subscribers. You can see this map here, how DV is connected across the globe. And it's amazing. Our subscribers support our mission in everything that we do. And they help us create archaeology that we can all share, all learn from and all enjoy just like we are tonight. So a massive thank you to all of those. But that is it from me. I am now going to pass over to Lisa, who's going to lead us into our main discussion. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Jenny. Hi, Maya. Hi, Martin. Hi, everyone. I see a lot of familiar names and faces uh, popping up on the screen. So it is so fantastic um, to be here tonight. This is a quote, uh, Martin and I had a long chat about uh, this event and this is a fantastic quote um, that really motivated us to, to want to, to have this event this evening. And um, as Ginny said, we're gonna have some links at the end of the, of the talk tonight. There's so much detail that has gone into the excavations at Sutton Hill and we don't, we don't have time to possibly share everything. And we know so many of you will want to hear more archaeology, all the archaeology. So bear with us. We'll send you all the links. And we've also got a fantastic book deal uh, for you from Martin's publisher if you wanted to grab his book about Sutton Hoo. And all of that information will be coming at you um, after the talk is over. Um, so the quote, you know, one of the fantastic things about Martin as an archaeologist is that he is not afraid to ask big questions and to move on from from ideas that seem to be written in stone and accepted as knowledge. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we really wanted to do this tonight. Um, if you ask him, he will say that he's just someone who dug a few sites and wrote a few books, but we all know that that is ridiculous. <laughs> he's done um, fantastic and very important excavations in the UK like Port Mahomic, which is very relevant to our site at Lindisfarne. Um, and also he's now in the middle of a big excavation on Sicily. Um, and written many important books about his sites, but also about the methodology of excavation and how we dig as archaeologists and the, and the kind of planning and the, and the ideas that we need to bring to our work to keep it current. Um, he's a very influential person in fieldwork and, and archaeology in the UK, never mind his dance floors, uh, moves on the dance floor of many conferences, archaeology conferences across the world as well. Um, and I have known Martin um, since my time as editor at Current Archaeology, and it seemed very, very uh, apropos to start this series with him because when DB first launched at FlagFen, Martin was our first ever speaker, and he was on site at FlagFen with us the very day that we sunk the first spade into the soil as Dig Ventures. So um, we are very, very pleased to welcome him back uh, to the fold. So. I imagine that what brought a lot of you to the event this evening was, of course, the big glossy Netflix film, The Dig. And we are, of course, going to examine some of, of what the movie shared, but also look far beyond the superficial Hollywood treatment of the site. So without further ado, let's crack on with the archaeology. Um, and I do have a question for you, Martin. Everybody wants to know what first got you started into archaeology? How did you become an archaeologist? Uh, well, I was, <clears throat> how do you do everybody? Thank you so much for coming and thank you Lisa for inviting me. Uh, this, is, uh, this is quite an exciting, different kind of thing for me because usually I'm giving a talk and here we're having a discussion. And uh, I am sorry to, 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 to find out that I am part of that discussion, but I will do my best to, re <laughs> to react. So uh, I was um, in the army for, for 15 years or so and <clears throat> then wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, I actually wanted to be a poet. 
and uh, that was um, uh, I don't I don't need to do it now because I've got a brilliant daughter who's a very good poet uh, and spends a lot of her time in pubs being a poet. Uh, but I got interested in the subject and I went backwards in time until I got to Beowulf and uh, the Godothin and, and those sort of things and began to wonder what life was like there. So I actually became interested in the early British Isles uh, before I became interested in archeology. span However, I was a, a trained as a scientist and, um, and, and an army officer. So I had some uh, random skills to apply and discovered that uh, the best thing that I'd done was to go on a dig. So I went on a dig, I went to um, Charlton and I went to uh, Winchester. They were just near where I lived and started digging. And then I didn't stop digging after that. So it was fun. <laughs> but um, yes, do you, want me to, do you want me to show a picture of myself? Yes, absolutely. I was afraid you might say that. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Right, big screen. Look at that. <laughs> so on the left is me in the army. And I left in um, 1971. And uh, so I was about, I was about 32 then. And uh, I left and, uh, and became a freelance. So it was just about the beginning of rescue archaeology and you could earn a living, uh, a rather, uh, rather sort of slight living, but you could exist. This site at Bishop Hill was dug by the York Archaeological Trust just starting out. And uh, so I had, um, I, I was, uh, I had an income of, of uh, 40 pounds a week then. And um, then uh, I started to do other excavations, um, mainly freelance. And uh, then I joined WEMRAC, which was a unit um, created by Philip Ratz, Graham Webster and others in the West Midlands. And from there I got recruited to dig Sutton Hoo. And that was really exciting. And from there I got recruited to go to the University of York. I, 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 would, I did find, and I think it's probably still true, I found the career ladder in, <clears throat> in archaeology rather obscure. It was rather difficult to know how to navigate it. Uh, but uh, I did find also that it was a very, very friendly profession and people were interested in each other. Uh, they noticed if you were an enthusiast and uh, they latched onto that. And so in a way, I've been hugely lucky, I realize that, uh, but uh, it's mainly due to the people I met. So um, let's turn to some of the really, the interesting beginnings of your project at Sutton Hoo. So of course, when you arrived, you were picking up where Basil Brown sort of left off and you were bringing in new ideas, um, a field research procedure that was kind of adapted from what you had learned when you were in the army. So. Let's set the scene of when things yeah. started for you at Sutton Hoo. Yeah, in, in, in the army, you have a um, sort of mnemonic to help you prepare for battles, which is called SMIAC. Situation, mission, execution, administration and logistics and communications, it went. And so I, when I became an archaeologist, a field worker, I sort of adapted that and made a... Um, Next, okay. I made a kind of um, strawn by Liz Hooper. This is rather a nice drawing, uh, a, a staged approach. I'm not the first person to thought of this by any means, but it was quite interesting that in the early seventies, there, there wasn't really a tradition of, of this kind of approach where you took time to learn about the site and then designed a program for it. Um, we were quite Barkerian in those days. Uh, Philip Barker had taught us that there's no fast way of doing excavation. You just start at the beginning and then you are very, very careful and arrive at the end. So he taught us a lot of really good things, uh, but it didn't quite match the world of rescue <clears throat> that I was in then. So I found this was, was quite a handy way to proceed. 
And then when um, I was, uh, um, can't remember when exactly when it was, uh, in about 1982, I think, they advertised a job uh, to do a new programme at Sutton Hoo. This was uh, advertised in the London Gazette. And um, um, hmm, sorry, I've got to, uh, I, I haven't realised that you can't go forward using my computer, but I'll try it now. Next. So basically, uh, we all had to be interviewed, the people who wanted to do the job, and we all had to write um, a design. So that was very much in my... I think you're muted, Martin. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, well, I, um, here we are at Sutton Hoo and I'm just explaining, I was just explaining how I got the job of directing it. It was advertised, basically, it was advertised. And then um, you applied and you had to apply with a, with a design. And my design was, uh, the, the thing that was unlike the other designs was that I said, uh, whatever we did, uh, we would not dig the whole site because that was very much the sort of mood of the age. You can't understand anything unless you dig it all. And uh, I thought that would be wrong on a number of counts, but the main one was the fact that we shouldn't destroy anything if we didn't actually have to. Uh, and I thought that my approach, which involved a lot of uh, non-destructive survey before I started, would mean that we could decide where to dig in a rational way. Now, whether that happened, you, you must be the judge whether that happened, but that certainly was my, my intention. This is the site as we, as we discovered it, in, rediscovered it in 1982. Of course, all the great glory days of, of Basil Brown were well over. Uh, it had been left as um, a site. It, wasn't, uh, it was only partially scheduled. Uh, the new landowners uh, couldn't do anything to it, so they let it overgrow. It was full of, it was overgrown with bracken. And the first time we went on this site, we had to fight our way through bracken, which was higher than I was. And it was absolutely full of rabbits. Rabbits love burial mounds. It's their favourite thing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the medieval period, the, the burial mounds in this part of Suffolk were actually reused as rabbit warrens. We, we found in Mound 2, we found the hole where you, where you put the ferrets in and where the rabbits run out. So, ah, that's it. Okay, so the idea then was to get an evaluation which taught us as much as we could possibly learn about the site before deciding what to do there. So instead of saying, we're gonna dig everything, uh, instead of saying, we're gonna dig the barrows, uh, we said, we don't know what we're gonna dig. We're going to, learn about it as much as we can. Topographic, plant mapping, surface collection, all these things were applied and many of them will be familiar to you. And of course, since the um, early 1980s, they've, they've, uh, they've accelerated and become much better. So in, you have to forgive me, in, in a way, this is a bit of a trip down memory lane, or rather it is uh, historic in the sense of these are methods that were used in the past, but being historic is, is not so bad really if you're into history. Um, next. So first thing was to clean up the place. So we did lots of mowing and uh, we expelled the rabbits and uh, mm -hmm. there was the site. And in, in the woods, you can see a little um, caravan and a hut. And that's where we uh, uh, had our guards. When we started out, there was a, a bit of a pressure from various people, but the particular pressure from the treasure hunters who decided that we were, had some sort of monopoly and this wasn't a good idea. I had to um, negotiate with them, but successfully, I'm glad to say. But before then, we had to guard the site to make sure nobody dug a hole in it. And I should explain that in 1982, somebody 
that's before I started, they did dig a hole. They, they, dug, a, they dug quite a big hole um, in, in the Imam 12. It was a pity. I don't think they really found anything, but it alerted us. So we lived in the caravan in the woods looking after, we took it in turns and uh, students who wanted to get away from their parents at Christmas uh, went and stayed in the caravan there and uh, repelled the borders. So I spent time on my own there as well. And uh, to pass the time, uh, since I'm keen on golf, I met a, I, I played a, a game of golf. There, there, were actually, there were actually 16 mounds when I came. And the idea was to tee off on mound one and then hit the golf ball to two and then from two to three, three to four and so on. And while I was uh, hitting the ball from number one in the general direction of it, where it says round 18, which didn't exist then, um, I noticed that it wouldn't stay still. It kept rolling back in my eye. Did I disappear? Uh, your sound went off for a, a minute again. I don't know why. <laughs> Really strange. Okay. Anyway, I was telling this story about how I found Mount, 80, uh, eight, Mount 17 with a, with a golf ball. Uh, <laughs> it was part of the way that uh, the topography was appreciated. Uh, I had a huge opportunity here because I could really learn about it. Okay. I'll just. Uh, yeah. So your excavations were supported by the British Museum, the Society of Antiquaries, and the BBC. And yes. obviously their research agenda was probably very much about the mounds, but you decided to take a completely different tack. And, and was that what gave you the opportunity to try lots of different things? Yes, they were a bit suspicious about this, um, the way I approached it. They, they didn't like the idea of two, two years without any TV programs, for example. The BBC were a bit worried about that. Um, <clears throat> various people in the Society of Antiquaries uh, harumphed a bit and said, <laughs> what, what is all this about? And they didn't like the idea that the, that, that I, I took a, a a sort of social stance. I said you have you, this was rather an important site. We couldn't just go and do what we liked with it. And it was important to explain to people that first of all this was for everybody, not just for us. Um, and secondly, we were, we were going to be very cautious about what we what we what we destroyed. And um, but the BBC came round and they realised that the actual evaluation process was really quite interesting and I think they made quite a good film about it. It's their lighting that you see here so they had their flood lighting because they wanted to see what the site looked like at night and as you see all these nice little dips and hollows come up so we, we could we could do some micro topography that that's mound two incidentally you're looking at and in the distance of the woods of uh, the lights of Woodbridge Uh, so we mapped the, uh, when we mown the site, took the bracken off and mown it, the first spring after that, lots of flowers came up. It was really rather extraordinary. Um, there was no sheep to eat them yet, so they came up and they gave us patterns. The grass gave us patterns too, so we drew the patterns, and that's the picture you see on the left there, different kinds of grass. And did that, in, reveal, did that reveal anything to you about the archaeology that you hadn't already known? Well, what it revealed to us, which we'd sort of guessed but not known, was the a degree to which this site had been dug by lots of people in the past. And OK, some of them might have been burying a sheep, but others were definitely after the mound. And some of them were just area excavations that had taken place. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was really quite a, a um, quite a. It's quite a revelation. Um, and then we used lots of uh, geophysics and um, everyone's familiar with this. I think we, where we were lucky, uh, we were so lucky in so many ways, but where we were lucky was having the time to try different instruments. Also, even more luckily, we didn't have to pay for them because I simply said to, uh, all my friends, bring your instrument and see <laughs> see what it can see. And uh, so we collected it. We selected a piece of the site, 
and then ran a proton a flux gauge and resistivity over the same area. And this shows their scores. The black means they saw something. And then of course we dug it to see what it was they had seen. So and we also did a metal detector survey. Lots of um, uh, metal detection was done. And what we mainly found there was uh, ammunition uh, because this site had been used in the war as a training, a training area. Uh, but in the middle, there's a, there's a hut, the BM hut. Is my little arrow showing there? Yes, it is. Oh, excellent. Well, that's the, that, that's the BM. The signals there were very, very high because the British Museum, when they came after the war to look at the site and, and uh, do some test excavation, um, they had a Coca-Cola dispenser there. And these <laughs> are all the bottle tops that accumulated in the middle of the site. <clears throat> Okay, and we did some prototype work. Here is the, the radar uh, Mike Gorman produced. They, the Scott Polar Institute in Cambridge were building this radar to see whether they could map the land surface underneath the ice. And as you see, it's a, it's a rather, um, uh, it's, it's a rather uh, quaint machine. I think it's got a lot of TV personality. So did that machine over. end up in the did that machine end up in the Antarctic or the Arctic after it was done with you? <laughs> no, I think they they became a bit <laughs> a bit more high tech after us. I mean, I'm not saying it didn't work. Uh, it it just was very much a, um, a first idea before soil sounding radar really got going. Later on, we used uh, you know the, the the state of the art Japanese instruments and so on. And they were all very good at they're especially good at detecting where people already made a hole in the ground. And particularly when they'd attacked a mound, you could see the, the, that that um, the effects there. Anyway, the effect of all this, gather it all together, and on the right-hand screen you can see the map that we were able to draw. Essentially, the black is excavations that had already happened, and then the stippling represents the depth of soil and the degree of disturbance. Uh, so that gave us a bit of better idea of what the deposit was like and how much of it was left. And on the left hand side, the uh, surface collection showed us where the prehistoric site was, uh, which is the big long kind of banana shaped bit here, um, as opposed to the early medieval site, which is also marked crisscross. That also, I think that gave us a bit of confidence that uh, we knew something about how far the site stretched. Uh, and there was some other information too, which I, which I won't bore you with, but generally speaking, we thought we probably had enough to create a design. And the design is here. So the prehistoric site is actually quite large. Prehistoric site's enormous and very long lived. So it starts in the late Neolithic and goes all the way on to the Roman period. And it's, it's, I'm gonna show you a little bit of that because I think it was, it, it, it's been rather underrated through, through the Sutton Hoo story. Everybody's fixated on the treasures and the gold and the mounds and so on, and quite rightly. Uh, but the prehistoric ancestor of this site is really, really important. Uh, and as I'll try and show you, I hope I've remembered to give, give you a picture. Um, the final, the, what, what this site looked like in the Anglo-Saxon period was a set of field boundaries. So ridges uh, creating little, little square fields. And when the Anglo-Saxons came, they decided to put their mounds on the corner of those fields. They were reading the landscape and recognized that people had been there before them and that they now own the land, so that they're gonna put their mounds on, on the corners, really nice. Anyway, here's the design. So it's like a cruciform transect. Um, the idea is to uh, catch the order in which the burials took place. Um, and um, that then starts to introduce what we wanted to make out of this whole exercise, which was not treasure, uh, not kings, uh, not even rich burials, but the, the story. So we were after the story rather than the things even. 
And so even when a mound was pretty damaged, it became part of our program. Nevertheless, we didn't just say, oh dear, and move on. That became part of the program. So we did the evaluation over till 86, then did the survey and then the analysis, then the publication 2005. So it, it, took, a, it took a fair amount of time, um, but it was great fun. <laughs> It's so nice to hear that you had fun. <laughs> we did have fun. So uh, would you like to hear about digging or do you want to just uh, ask me something? <laughs> no, let's hear, of course, I mean, there will be people sitting at home right now going, tell us about the digging, Martin. We want to okay, hear all okay. about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that uh, transect you saw, we opened it up. It's slightly less than a hectare and it isn't the whole site. And that was the object of the exercise. So it was laid out over the mounds that we already knew were quite damaged. So it was counterintuitive, really. So instead of hunting the gold, we were hunting the story. So and the hunting story involved uh, digging mounds with the least damage possible. That means choosing the mounds that were already most damaged. And that's what that transect did. And here we are with the, the first mound, as it turned out, mound five, which is so damaged you couldn't even see it, but it was there. And its burial chamber is where my arrow is circling, if you can mm -hmm. see it. And that uh, uh, reverend figure burying over is Rupert Bruce Mitford, uh, the man who studied all the finds after the war and wrote uh, uh, three enormous volumes, uh, which uh, are monuments in their own right. And so this is a uh, horizon mapping, which I sort of got from Brian Hope Taylor who was one of our early visitors. Um, and uh, it seemed logical anyway, so I did it and we did it with trowels. Um, we also had machines like this is the uh, raining machine here, which rains so that when it's clean, we rain it and then the contrast comes up. And you can follow the story here, Bronze Age ditch, Iron Age field boundary, uh, the Mound Five uh, quarry pit, and then the Mound 5 burial, and then the Mound 5 excavation uh, pit here, where somebody's trying to get into the mound. They've dug this, gone into the mound like that. So that was that's a little vignette, and uh, other things are similar to that. So digging the mounds is uh, was uh, uh, quite a controversial business. We wanted to make sure we understood how the mound was made up. Um, and uh, so we did, we did need to have some running sections across. And that's what you see on the left hand side, 1988. On the right hand side, you can see how mine, Mound 5 was dug in 1971 by the British Museum team. These are kind of wheelerish boxes here mm -hmm. with separating them. Uh, so there's a little bit of excavation history in its own right. Um, the idea of these were to, we had to, we'd wanted to draw the sections, but we did more than that. I'll show you that in a second. This here uh, that's been excavated is the re-excavated trench of Basil Brown, which he dug in 1938. So Martin, can we talk about this box for a minute? Because I'm sure people uh, seeing that would be wondering what, what would the, the purpose of the box really was here your previous photo yes the, the, these are ours you mean or, or yes yours ours okay well the main the main purpose was to get um running sections through the makeup of the mound so we could see how it was done mm -hmm. you could guess of course it had a quarry ditch all the way around it so you could guess that somebody dug a quarry ditch and just heat the stuff up and it could have been completely random in fact, it wasn't completely random, so it was worth doing. Um, and that would also enable us to come down softly on things that were done on the day of the burial. For example, if you dig a big hole um, and uh, you, you throw the soil up, the sand, then you make a big splash of sand, which, which shows that you've arrived at the moment of the, uh, that the burial was dug. Uh, we also knew there was a ship at some stage in this mound because in 1860, they dug a trench through it and found uh, a mass of um, ship rivets. And these 
ship rivets that uh, were already recognized by, by Basil Brown, um, these ship rivets had been not really recognized in the previous excavation of 1860. So they just gathered them all up and the newspaper account said they took them away and gave them to the local blacksmith to make them into horseshoes. So that's what happened to the Mound Two rivets. <laughs> so I'm now going to just show you what happened next. So this is on the right hand side, you can see the scatter of rivets which we plotted by doing this as an area excavation. And on the left, you can see all the people who visited this mound. First of all, a burial chamber, which was rectangular, was dug mm -hmm. in about 625 AD. And then uh, in uh, about 1600, so at the beginning of the 17th century, um, when the mounds had not yet been ploughed, the, uh, the, the excavation method then was to dig a big pit from the top of the mound uh, right until you hit the chamber and then help yourself to all the goodies. Uh, in the 1860, the technique was to dig a trench and put steps down so that the antiquary could go down and collect the good things the earth has to offer. Um, <laughs> 1938, here's Basil, Basil Brown's trench here. And then we come along and look. So, so it was really a re-excavation in many ways, also of the digs that had gone before you. Yes, it was, it was. That, that in some ways, that's the hardest part because you're dealing with sand on sand interfaces. I mean, they, 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 can, be, they can be very tricky. Mm. And they really rely on the most, the thing they most rely on is the thing we don't use so much now, which is the portable tower. So we used a lot of, we use the tower all the time so that you could, by standing well back or up in the air, you could see where the interfaces were and that, and that was really helpful. However, <clears throat> this burial, just like, just like most of the ones that have been robbed, had been nearly cleared out. But we approached the bottom with enormous care. This is, by the way, this is the one that, that where we found the roller skates of Robert Pretty, the, 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 the landowner's son. I wondered if that was true. Yeah, it was true. Yeah, they chucked them in. At the, at the end. That's so funny. Uh, anyway, when we got to the bottom, we could see all these anomalies. Do you see these little patches on, on the bottom here? Yes. And some of them really thin and troweled away, but we, we knew that they weren't made by us. Uh, they must have been made by the people who dug the site in 1860, or the people who dug the pit in around 1600 or thereabouts. And some finds had been collected by Basil Brown. He'd found a lovely um, blue glass jar. He'd found a gilt bronze disc. He'd, he'd found bits of this uh, ransacked burial. So we had those. And then we thought we'd try and find out what happened by doing a chemical map of the base of the chamber. So here is um, uh, uh, Andy Kopp taking 640 samples from the base and then they, these were an, analyzed by inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy by the Queen's University and and they what they did was extract elements in concentrations from each of these samples so that mainly mainly cations I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you hang on a second I'll show you that. that's a really fascinating thing that you've done because you know as you're saying you're dealing with a surface that has had so many interventions on it already but actually testing the chemical makeup of the soil in such a regulated pattern, I'm sure, was incredibly useful to your conclusions. Well, yes. I th in other words, yes, I think we did believe the result. <laughs> Just about. Here it is. Uh, you can see the anomalies being mapped here. And you can see things like the ship rivets, these are little circles collected. And then 17 odd finds that uh, uh, we either knew about or we'd found. And there's the person. So the person consists of a concentration of aluminium, barium, lanthanum, strontium, and phosphorus. Uh, and it seems to be all sort of in this area. Uh, but that can simply be that the person has been uh, shifted, uh, if you see what I mean, uh, during the robbing operation, or, or I should say excavation, really, uh, in the 1860s. In the 1860s they, they, 
they were driven by curiosity. They weren't just robbers. By any mm. means. Uh, so it was possible, I don't know, it was possible to make some kind of a bit, bit of a, an, an idea of what, what was there. Uh, a, a, and basically that was a, a person lying in the, uh, on their back and in, in the uh, chamber, uh, they had a cauldron, Ron's cauldron, they had an, an, an iron chain of some sort. Uh, they had a shield because we got a bit of a shield. They had a, a buckle, they had a belt buckle, they had a bit of a buckle. They had a sword, we have a tiny tip of a sword. So tiny, tiny things indicated the kind of thing that should have been there using mound one as our library of the kind of things that were being buried. So I mentioned that the idea was to try and work out how the mound was put together. And um, on the top left, you see Kathy Royal here uh, drawing the, uh, the mound in, in glorious Technicolor. So although we were felt we felt we were kind of modern people doing modern excavation, there were certain things that still work well for interpretation purposes. And one of these is the section. So I wasn't one of these people who threw away sections in favor of doing a strap diagram only. Um, and I wasn't one of these people who threw away the notebooks either in favor of just having record cards. We had notebooks and record cards. We had uh, um, strap diagrams and we had sections. And also we invented this thing which you see on the bottom left hand side. This is basically a strap diagram uh, which is colored up uh, to show the Munsell color of the soil of each of these contexts that were recorded when the mound was being dismantled. And you could probably see that there's a there's a great range of colors here. The, 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 the stuff on the top is really very lean, very sandy. And the stuff on the bottom is much more humic from which you can deduce. Here's the platform of the mound, by the way, where the burial chamber is. So that's the, 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 the uh, there, sorry, there's the buried soil there. And these are the soils thrown up when they did the digging. And these are the first ones that were done to build the mound. And this, then the mound was then finished off at the top there. Do you see? So there is, there is a, I think there is a, a kind of uh, sequence of construction which can, be, which can be derived from that. And then we also wanted to construct a mound. Um, uh, there was a certain amount of ob objections to constructing a mound, but I felt that in the end, although the site was private and although the excavation was privately funded in the way that the British Museum and the South of Antiquities, BBC and so on were involved, eventually I felt absolutely convinced that this site would come into the public domain and that the public would like to see it. And one way of doing this was to sort of plant a mound, <laughs> a full a full size mound so that everybody could immediately see what a what a what a, uh, a benefit it would be to the site, which is otherwise just a just a field. Uh, so we calculated. I asked a mathematician to calculate if I knew the diameter of a, a quarry ditch and and the depth of it, how high would the mound be? He came up with this formula you see here. It's an extremely long. long unbelievable formula of a prodigious length and typically came up with two different heights 2.7 and 3.8 oh well we use 3.8 so the mound is still there and children run up and down it with great glee and from the top you get a splendid view so i feel justified really so you know you've already discussed you know new techniques and and technologies that you were using and and here's another example of some intervention, interventions that you custom designed for the site. Um, how was that received at the time? You know, did, how did the profession feel about you sort of, not freestyling it, but, but really trying new things? Well, I think that was one way that I, I managed to win them over. What, what happened was that there were a lot of objections, letters to the Times and things saying, we don't need another dig at Sutton Who, it's a waste of money. Uh, the profession is engaged. Uh, it's got its back to the wall, in fact. Uh, it's been engaged in rescue work 
uh, we don't want any of these vanity projects, treasure hunts, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they threw a lot at us. And uh, in order to try and uh, see whether we could get support for the project, we uh, invited uh, all the members of the Society of Medieval Archaeology, so 1,000 plus of them, to a meeting at Senate House in um, London. And at that meeting, uh, I uh, presented our plan and said, first of all, our plan is very sparing of the resource. It, 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 it's not profligate. Um, secondly, it's going to have, um, it's going to be a laboratory for, for new techniques. Uh, I'd worked in the commercial sector for a decade or so, and I knew that there was very little time to develop anything. And uh, it, it, it you know, just reminds, uh, it just reminds me of that, of those stories, you know, I'm too busy, I'm too busy trying to win the war to invent how to do it. And, and I'm afraid that was very much what I thought about rescue in those days. And there was also a very, um, a, a sort of solid feeling that everybody knew how to dig. There wasn't a mystery about it. You know, it was just do your best more or less. And I felt that was inadequate. And uh, so we could use ourselves as a, as a laboratory. So that's why we tried out all these remote mapping techniques. Um, but this is a bit different here. This is, this is Mount 17, my most favorite mound, which I found with my golf ball. And um, here's um, Annette Rowe digging it uh, with one of the structures created by our, our wonderful site foreman, Peter Berry, who invented the Rainer and, and you just told him what you wanted and he came back and invented it. He was a marvelous guy. He was the church warden, but I managed to wean him off the church and onto the pagan mounds without much difficulty. So this is, um, a, 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 well, it's a fine burial and it was, it was dug in, in stages, as you could imagine. Uh, um, oh, sorry, keep doing that, there you go, there we are. Uh, and that's the plan of uh, a young man lying in a coffin. And one of the great things about this excavation was that it showed us a coffin very clearly and also four cleats, things that fasten the lid to the body of the coffin. And the significance of that is that there'd long been a, controver a controversy about Mound One and whether it had had a coffin. Well, it had cleats just like these. And so I was sure that it had a coffin and we then reconstructed it so that it had a coffin. That took some time for the British Museum to accept. But maybe they haven't, but it, it, otherwise it's, uh, I think, acceptable. This was a lovely burial, had bucket cauldron. Uh, it had lots of staining, so we'd got used to staining with our troweling and spraying and so on. And here there was some kind of a bag and in the bag was some lamb chops. <laughs> and then at the other end, a wonderful um, pile of stuff. Uh, there was a ring left by something wooden at this point. And then here there was lots of little bits of pieces sticking out of a big lump of earth. And that big lump of earth had little black stripes in it. So that probably was the bridal, we thought. And so that was, uh, er that was taken up as a lump. The whole thing was taken up as one big lump. And look, they put it into an X-ray machine. Uh, this is Man Yi doing the, the excavation, but before that it went into an X-ray. So they get the thing, you can turn it round and put it at different, different angles. And, and that showed you the kind of thing that was in there. So that was great. And then Man Yi excavated it, from which we got the bridal. There's the bits, the bit and the other bits lying, lying in the ground. That's where they would have lain. So that's what she was able to do when she plotted them. And that was the base of the tub there. Very nice. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then we did a, a strat diagram for the, for the mound, which was meant to show you what had happened on the day of burial. So they weren't strictly speaking stratified but you could tell which had been put in when and so this meant that the day of burial itself could be uh, could be could it take its part if you like in 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 the drama 
uh, one of the most uh, um, poignant things was this comb here, which wasn't really, it wasn't in the coffin. It had been sort of thrown in later on top of the coffin uh, by one of the uh, burial party. So I'm taking you now to, um, I've been trying to follow these discoveries in, in the sequence in which they happened in the past rather than the sequence in which we dug them. Um, and uh, at the end of the of the sequences are these burials on the edge of the of the royal burial ground. In fact, there were two lots. One was round mine five, and the other one was was on the edge. And uh, these are very interesting archaeologically. They were really fascinating, and they were certainly hard to dig. They they showed in the surface as many burials do rectangles. Uh, against the subsoil, um, but when you dug them, uh, there didn't seem to be a skeleton in them. Instead of that, you got these shapes. So mm. that shape there is a head. It's dark brown, blacky brown sand. Here's so, some. So just for the people watching who might not have um, their eye in necessarily, what you yeah. mean is when you were excavating these graves. The only way that you could tell that they were graves, obviously, because the bone had the soil was too acidic and the bone had gone, was just these colorations in the soil. Yes, you you could also tell, funny enough, from the from the the noise. So with the when the trowel is um, uh, emptying grave fill, it sort of tinkles, and then when it stops tinkling, you're on something smoother. So then you can uh, back off. I, I did, this was um, my team, I should have mentioned earlier, was, was collect, used a lot of students and volunteers and they, they were, uh, th that was another little battle because people wanted this to be wholly professional. Well, I wanted to be professional too, but there were very, some very important tasks for volunteers to do. And probably the most effective one was digging these graves. So. Although we did, of course, um, use our professionals to pioneer the method, um, we soon discovered that these people were, had been put in the graves in a very untidy way. They'd been dumped in. And the question was, was this significant in some way? So we needed to know how they were lying in the ground. However, of course, without the skeleton, it's quite hard to do that. And instead of getting a skeleton, you get a sort of brown person. And um, to make that most, uh, it, it, to, to find those people in the most attached way, the best thing to use was a volunteer who hadn't really been on an excavation before, strangely as it may seem. All you had to say with them is, is in there, there is an anomaly, there is something different and you can, you'll be able to see it, you'll be able to hear it, and you've got as long as you like. <laughs> so they would then start making these shapes. I, I, I'm particularly proud of these feet, <laughs> which were made by, made by one of our volunteers. So uh, when I say they were made, you can see that, they're, that they are different from the subsoil. <laughs> There's no, different, no doubt about it. But some of the jobs they did were absolutely fantastic. Um, I should explain that there is some bone. Uh, this is one of the Sandmen here. This is how they look uh, as, as a sort of solid looking person. But in this case, um, the crust came off and the bones were underneath. And that means that there were flecks of bones within the Sandmen. That, that means we could date them with radiocarbon, which was good, of course. So uh, after the excavation, that's the result. There's our uh, cruciform transect. And um, um, I'm going to, um, Lisa's going to move me on to some other things, I think. I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm hopeful that the things we're going to move on to are your favorite things to talk about. Um, so generally, I mean, obviously, we've learned a lot from your excavations. And your conclusions are different to those of Basil Brown's. So I'm sure that we're all very interested to hear, you know, how how did what you find change our understanding of that time period? And, you know, as a second question to that, Martin, what do you think is next for the site? 
Yes. Well, I think first, first of all, then um, I'll, I'll show you some of the um, conclusions, but 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 not everything. I think some of the stuff is quite densely argued, and and um, really it's best done um, either in a long lecture, but but we haven't got one here, so it's best done in a book, really. Yeah. But I wanted to show you something of those, and then something of the. Um, our attempts to communicate with the wider public because um, that was it, that was important part of the plan. So this is this is a little bit of a parody of what you can say if you um, uh, if you're guessing. Well, I don't mind guessing occasionally. So I've now guessed on the basis of the kings of e the East Angles that are listed in the. Uh, in, uh, well, known, some have known to be, and some are listed in the uh, the documents. Uh, they are uh, Waha, Wafa, Tutla, Radwald, and uh, then Eni and Regenheri. You can see that their all their their dates of of death are are given there. So we know that much. Is it a royal burial ground? Probably. I, I see no reason why it shouldn't be. Um, it's the early seventh century. That's the time that uh, these kingdoms were being designed in England. Places like Wessex and Kent and so on are, are documented as having kings, but there aren't kings very obviously before then. Uh, this, is, this is a sort of a kingdom building period and so, yes, I think it's likely. Uh, we know that this burial ground isn't any bigger than this because we did the evaluation and trenches to make sure we'd got all the burials or at least test and hope with it we had. Um, we know we've got one woman in the graves that have been opened. That's mound 14. Uh, and so it was, the, I'm just guessing that the, the very rich burial, mound one, um, is indeed Redwald, as has been, as was said by uh, Hector Munro Chadwick when he when he visited in in 1939, uh, he had no doubt about it, and it seems very likely. Uh, there's all sorts of hints there. He's got the regalia. He's uh, he's he has some sort of Christian stuff in his tomb, direct, uh, uh, which is taken from Byzantium. So it's possible. Uh, I just put Aini, his brother, into the um, who died six ten quite early. Put I put him into the horse burial. Uh, Regenheri is his son. He's burying his son. So Regenheri died in six seventeen. So I put him in mound two and so on. The first three, five, six, and seven, they're all cremation burials and they're all in a row. So I thought they might be the earliest three to die. Redwell's queen, if it is her, died in 650 because her finds were much later than the other finds. They were um, mid seventh century. And then the execution victims, we don't know who they were. Uh, they are buried either round mound five, which we think is the earliest mound, or on the edge by the track, which is a very old track. It's a prehistoric trackway. So that suggests that the burial mounds are uh, if, if you see what I mean, provide a setting for the executions, but they're not, the executions not connected with it. Um, I think they're not, uh, we had a tremendously long debate on um, ANSTAX, I think it's called, this is the US uh, chat line on the Anglo-Saxons, about whether the Anglo-Saxons would have done human sacrifice. And one lot said, never, never. No, quite unlike, not British, not Anglo-Saxon at all. And another lot said, uh, uh, oh, it's just like them. And then um, uh, the final lot were right. He said, it, it, they, they, they're probably not contemporary with the mounds at all. And we were able to show that using the radiocarbon dates on the tiny flecks of bone uh, that were in the, uh, excavated, uh, the excavated graves of the, execution victims. 
so that uh, is one way of looking at it. That's a historical way. And for some people, that's fine. They go from Sutton Hoo to Beowulf and back from Beowulf to Sutton Hoo, and, and they have, they're happy that that explains everything. Uh, it's not the way I went. Uh, and also, we were gifted with a completely different picture because at the end of the uh, excavation program, um, uh, we had three different sites. So the first of these uh, was a, a family cemetery of um, cremations and innovations came up when the visitor center was being built. So that was a rescue excavation done by the Suffolk Archaeological Unit. Um, that had little tiny mounds and it also had burials of cremations in bronze bowls. So that, that they, were, they were a family, if you like, practicing. <laughs> then before they went to the big, uh, the, the big uh, glamorous burial mound of kings, that's uh, what we expected here. And then the execution sites would be would be the third, so sixth century, seventh century, and then eighth to eleventh. That's the storyline that we came up with. Mm -hmm. So that meant something a bit different uh, to simply having a few named kings. Um, this is a shorthand way of expressing it. Um, the Anglian family cemetery, 590. There they are digging a hanging bowl with a cremation in it. The Anglian pagan kingdom, 59650, is the, is the burial ground of kings, the, the, the famous mounds. And then they're superseded by uh, these graves in which people have been hanged and uh, they must belong to the Christian period, the period when the when the Christian kings governed governed East Anglia. And so that requires some kind of explanation, clearly. Well, the fact is that during uh, the past uh, few centuries, uh, the archaeology has changed what it what it wants to do. Now, this is relevant both to what you're trying to find out, what you think it means, and also the way you do it, because the way you do excavation is very much linked to what you want to know, whether you like it or not. And here is a just a little sort of uh, poster, if you like, trying to explain how the objectives change the methodology. So about 1600, we know that they dug these big circular holes through the middle of mounds and that they help themselves to the, the goodies there. The 1860s built, they had a trench and so doing this trench meant that there was more care taken and also more driven by curiosity. We, we'd actually know the person that did the excavations in 86 called Mr. Barrett. And then in 1938-39 they're looking at uh, a, a, an excavation which was inspired by the landowner, Mrs. Pretty. She's used Basil Brown, who's, who's quite a celebrated local uh, Suffolk excavator. And uh, when the ship had been defined and the burial chamber was uh, a, a blank patch of dark earth, they brought in uh, Charles Phillips and, and uh, Stuart Piggott, W.F. Grimes, see relaxing there. Those, those were people who came in for that first period. And then uh, they, focused on Mound One in a big way, of course, and uh, that's uh, what created the finds which dominate uh, the early medieval display in the British Museum and which have made the site famous. Uh, Rupert Bruce Medford, who wrote them up, came back in 64 to 71. They re-excavated the Mound One trench, which had just been left filled with bracken, and then subsequently used as a place to practice um, with uh, Bren gun carriers driving <clears throat> into trenches and out of them. Uh, so there was quite a lot of things to clear up and actually they'd done a very good job in 1939. They, they hardly found anything at all left in the, in the chamber. Uh, but they did find some prehistory and they did do some landscape history. Uh, that was all part of the driver. And then our project came along in 1983 uh, it was done in a different way. We were, first of all, we had an international group of uh, seminars, uh, which uh, we invited people from all the countries that were interested in, or most of them, um, 
obvious places like Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Germany and France and so on, but also United States had a very strong group of uh, early medievalists. And uh, so we were able to uh, get a lot of advice and uh, we had a lot of fun having our discussions as the excavation rolled, rolled forward. And I know I'm making some of you jealous because sometimes in the rescue field, there just isn't time to talk. There isn't time to think. It's just uh, uh, work, 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 and you're up against it. Uh, you've got a deadline. Uh, you have to dig in all weathers. Well, so did we actually, but I mean, on the whole, we didn't have a bad time of it. Well, according to the film as well, so did Basil. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that was true. They, they didn't have very much rain. They, they, according to Charles Phillips, they didn't have any, you know, a lot of it. Mm. Um, they said the, the burial, you can see Grimes there lying on the burial deposit. He said it was very tough. He said um, something like, uh, in, in the interview, he said something like, you could have jumped on that burial chamber, it wouldn't have made the slightest difference. Not that we did, of course. <laughs> 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 no, we just lay on it, so that was fine, of course. And then uh, in 2001, when we built the visitor center, there, there was a rescue excavation in advance by the Suffolk Union. So I think that's quite a nice kind of, it shows that time does not stand still for archeologists either. We're, we're always adjusting our view of the past. We're always looking at it through a different lens and trying to see more. I think we also try to see more and dig less. And I know we all love digging, but of course we have to use the finite resource argument. We can't just keep digging. And if you want to criticize me for not digging the whole of the burial site, then that's fine. But I did decide right early on that it wasn't the right thing to do. If we designed a project which required the digging of the whole burial site to answer a question, it was the wrong question. And we should ask a question which preserved as much as possible. Even so, I think our excavation will be looked on as quite extravagant. So here are some of the communication efforts we did. This is the most important of them all. This is the Sutton Hoo Society, which was formed in a pub in Woodbridge from people who took their dogs for a walk in the area of the mounds. <clears throat> so for many years this has been a nice place for the people of Woodbridge across the river uh, to take an airing and, and to give their dogs a run after the rabbits. So when we came uh, we had two um, uh, people, we had two groups of people to, to pacify Firstly, the dog walkers, and secondly, the owners of Sutton Hoo House, Tranmer House, as it's now called. Um, nice people, um, but she became a widow, and uh, like Mrs. Pretty had, Mrs. Tranmer became a widow, and didn't like people walking all the time. And they kept knocking on the door saying, where's Sutton Hoo then? And uh, particularly after we'd been on television a bit, uh, you know, they, they were annoying her. So we made a right of way which led to our site and diverted it. Didn't ask anybody, but we, we diverted it so that they didn't worry her. And the Sutton Hoo Society were very good and they, they acted as our guides. So we didn't have to stop digging to show the public round. They're still going, by the way, and they're working with the National Trust now and they still do the guided tours. And if they were a bit strange to start with some of their tours, uh, they became really expert as people will do. This visitor's site. So there's the BBC in action. Ray Sutcliffe was our uh, director. Michael Billington does the radio. Um, we made quite a few programs. It was um, really very, it was good fun, very good indeed. And we had a lot of we had a great many viewers. It's it's a bit disconcerting though. They do they do um, feedback. You know they they ask the viewers what they liked and what they didn't like. And one one of the questions is, um, uh, what do you what do you think of the presenter? That was me. <laughs> I hope you got good feedback. Well, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, what happened was that the people who said yes, they liked the presenter. <laughs> 
were, uh, wait for it, uh, they were women, that was okay. Uh, they were ABC One social group, that was a bit mm -hmm. limited, and over 55. <laughs> so so I, felt, I didn't feel completely uh, enlivened by this news, but who cares? Mm. So they went down quite well, the, the programmes, I'm glad to say. So that was part of the communication system, and here's some of our uh, diggers. Uh, it's our campsite, by the way. So this is an old-fashioned dig with lots of um, caravans and, and portaloos and things like that. Uh, that. That's my caravan there where our, I lived with my companion, Madeleine, and four children. And then this is an old scout hut that we got hold of to act as a fine shed. And here is the typical coffee break. Everyone's exhausted, as you can see. Uh, this is a picture of the team and the, here's the Manpower Services Scheme. So they came and worked with us too in the early days. Quite enjoyed it, I think. Um, I, I mentioned some of these sandmen and in order to display them, which you may agree, you may not agree is a good idea, but we decided we would do that. Uh, so we displayed them by making casts uh, this is silicon rubber, this red stuff. And um, I, I met a sculptor in, uh, at, a, at, a, at a sort of day school in, in Norfolk, and he said, this is what I do. I, I, I make moulds of people and, and I make them in silicon rubber and then make them into fiberglass positives. So this is what we did. On the right is the Sandman and on the left is the thing that's being made. They, they've been, they were displayed in the National Trust's visitor centre for some time, but a lot of visitors didn't like them. They, they felt that they were disrespectful. Well, I think there's a point there. I think they are in a way disrespectful, but on the other hand, I felt that my Sutton who should have everybody in it, not just Redworld, um, and not even just Redwell's Queen, um, who I think did require resuscitation, and not even aristocrats, but just everybody. The people who were hanged uh, out and uh, outside the royal burial ground in the 8th to 11th century, though these were people who had, I think, views, real people with views. They didn't may for whatever reason, they didn't welcome the new regime. They didn't welcome uh, the Christianity. Uh, they felt that they were letting down their friends and relations who were across, across the North Sea in Denmark. Yes, it's, it's complicated history. It isn't, it isn't simple and it isn't necessarily moral for everybody. Uh, so I think I, these are absolutely fascinating. They put me in mind of the casts, you know, from Pompeii, which I think are so evocative and just very connecting, you know, for anyone who sees them to the people of the past. So I'm thrilled that you made these casts. I think they're wonderful. If you go to the site now, if you visit the site now, you can still see them on the site. There is, there is a little uh, kind of um, hatch which you, you pull aside and there are four or five, uh, no, I think there's just three now, three burials. Uh, but anyway, it's one of those conundrums. We're, we're always putting up with things like this and trying to work out what's right. So Martin, I am. I could listen to this for hours as I'm sure everyone feels the same, but I'm very conscious of time. Oh, okay, I'll speed up. So, and the questions are bursting at the seams. I keep oh, right. seeing them drop in and <laughs> people have so many questions for you. So I <laughs> wonder if you'd be happy to move on to the question and answer period or if there's anything from the presentation that you'd still like to share with us. Well, we do that. yes, there is, but, but I can do it in five minutes. Is that too long? Go for it. Five minutes. Okay, <laughs> so here, here's Seamus Heaney, that's him. Uh, opening the visitor center and since we it was opened in 2001 uh, we had a million visitors in our first 10 years so that's pretty pretty good uh, people love the site um, okay click uh, fantastic uh, I wanted to say that we're still working there um, this is the uh, research project that Madeleine and I did of course, uh, since Madeleine was my partner in this, it, it's got a lot of prehistory in it. She's a prehistorian, and uh, this is something I think quite exciting, could be done. 
it's starting very slowly. It's not going to happen in a hurry, but its main feature is that it's for volunteers to do. Well, I'll put my hand up for that because I'm also a prehistorian and I'm very interested in, in that part of Sutton Hill. Uh, here's the ship uh, in, in the, with its rivets, as you see. And what we're doing now is building a replica. That's a half sized replica, but we're now building a full size one. Here we are in Woodbridge. This is the uh, Woodbridge Marina and, and Tide Mill. And this is where they're building the ship. Uh, we've got plenty of oak. We've got plenty of uh, people have been very generous to us. And um, it's being built by a thing called the Ships Company, uh, who are Woodbridge people. They're based in Woodbridge. And they've got this hangar. Is that ship launching? Is the reconstruction launching this summer? <laughs> so you can go and visit that once it's open again, which is going to be fun. Um, for diggers amongst you, I wanted to make this point about how excavator ambition grows every single year. We want more, we want to see more and more. The left hand side of this little diagram are the centuries and the years. And then I've divided the techniques into mega, macro, micro, and nano. You see, we are getting now cleverer and cleverer at seeing more and more by doing less and less. That's the new excavation. So I think. You can't just say we we know we just have a um, a context and uh, everything is a context and we record everything in context. I don't think so. I think the digs of the future will need a lot more than that. Uh, here are some new methods from Norway. If anyone's really interested in mound digging, the project to to like is the Gokstad project. Uh, they are doing it's Viking, of course, but they're doing a lot of wonderful work there. Very interesting indeed. Um, and this is the uh, famous um, <laughs> XRF analyzer, chemical gun. This is a thing which tells you what elements are present uh, and various uh, people in various countries have been using this to characterize a section or characterize um, uh, the soil. So HS2, for example, has just done a magnificent um, survey of about uh, 10 square miles using a handheld XRF to see where the soil is rich with the uh, iron and lead and, and so forth. Um, in the interpretation side, and here I'm going to finish very quickly, uh, I, did, I do think we opened the book on Britain as a whole. Um, the, the jumping off point was Mound 17. Uh, it had a disc as part of the bridle one there. And we found the same sort of disc up in Pictland. Um, there's also one from Dalrieda and uh, one from the Moat of Mark. So there's a kind of equestrian uh, class in seventh century Britain. So before it was split up into three countries, they were rather closer, it seems. And uh, these are the uh, burials that were made by the Angles and Saxons bed burials, boat burials, horse burials, which by far the most important are the bed burials, which are the latest mounds constructed uh, by the Anglo-Saxons in England. So after the warriors like Sutton Hoo had been buried in mounds, then it was the turn of the women to be buried in mounds in special places, overlooking probably the land that they were responsible for. There are the countries on the right hand side, uh, the different um, countries of Benicia, Reged, Elmid and so on, which are still with us. And these are echoed in a very remarkable book by um, Iona and Peter Opie, published in 1982, where they collected all the words used by school children in the, in the school playground if you wanted to get people to get off you. If you, if, you were, if you were at the bottom of a heap, you shouted skinch or barley or keys, depending on where you are. And this map of these truce terms, as they're called, is very similar to the map of the kingdoms. I just leave you to work that one out. So many other mound builders are around. I think the Japanese are among the most fascinating. Here's a Kofun terraced. Here's the kind of distribution, they've got uh, something like 50,000 mounds 
uh, in Japan, 20,000 in this area. And in some ways, the story is similar. Uh, Buddhism uh, arrives in, um, in, um, in Japan and it stops mound building in favor of temples. Christianity arrives in Britain and stops mound building in favor of churches. That's it. I'm at your service now. <laughs> okay, well, I just want to say that is incredible whistle stop tour through your work at Sutton Hoo. Um, there's obviously so much more that you could say and that people want to know, but um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Maya now, who has been faithfully collecting questions. So prepare yourself, Martin, for to be bombarded. <laughs> I will do my best for you. Hi. Hi, Maya. Um, Thank you so much for that talk. And I think on behalf of everyone, I can say it was absolutely riveting. And I'm sure none of you have heard that pun in this context before. <laughs> anyway, thought I'd do it. Um, yeah, we've got loads of questions. So I'm gonna do my best to get through as many of them as, as we can in the time that we've got left. But first of all, you've already touched on this a little bit, but there's quite a few people, including Julie and um, a couple of others who've been asking to hear a little bit more about the relationship between Christianity and paganism on the site. Um, Julie wanted to know if um, if there's any relationship to what's happening at Prittlewell. And another question from Henry is, is it likely that the burial in Mound 1 was visible pagan resistance to incoming Christian conversion, or was it the disposal of a Christian king by a pagan successor? Yes, interesting. I, I think that um, the balance is with the mounds being uh, built by uh, pagan aristocracy to celebrate itself. I know there are Christian symbols in the Mound One burial, and for a long time that was used as a sort of, oh, well, I expect they're really Christian. But a, a, a large number of graves, uh, from very many parts of the world, particularly in Sudan, have Christian objects in them, and they are quite definitely not Christian. They, the Sudan ones, the X group, actually have sacrificed people in the entrance to the tomb. And I, I don't think that, that it's reasonable to think that. Also, the parallels which Rosemary Cramp has found with Beowulf, I think, are very convincing. Beowulf itself has Christian bits in it, of course, because these are uh, these are perfectly uh, educated people. I think that's what, I think everybody has a feeling, or not everybody, but some people had a feeling that the pagans were just barbarians and knew nothing about anything. Um, they were pretty active in Europe, and they weren't the only pagans, there were plenty of others there. And although pagan is a term of abuse now, I think it was then, it's just a sort of general catch-all uh, for beliefs which were very strong on, on ancestors and things like that. And prehistorians will be familiar with this and not worried by it. Uh, medievalists, I think, are a bit more worried by it. I think they've been uh, keen to see the Christians. Um, for me, it's, I, I have written about this in a, a book called Formative Britain. Uh, and I've tried to collect up all the sort of indications of what's going on. I think one of the most important indications is this, that although Augustine arrived in England in 597, uh, there are no signs of dated, there are no dated signs of uh, Christianity uh, in England until the late seventh century, which is actually when grave goods cease. And this has been proved by a tremendous project with, uh, with John Hines and Alex Bailiff. I mean, amazing piece of work. And it's quite a good date. It's converging on this date, late seventh century. It's when uh, Archbishop um, Hadrian arrived and, and, and basically it became institutional. And so it is quite interesting. And I'm working in Sicily now and the Muslims there are of course also uh, a, a new a new religion arriving in a Christian country. And that takes 75 years as well to become institutionalized. So it just takes time. It takes basically the third generation to stand up and say, we'll go for it. Uh, so I think that it's got some logic to it. 
mound one is you can compare it with all the other mounds built by all the other people in the world and there's a language of mounds there's a language of burial uh, grave goods as well I, I think there's a language which says this is this is pre-christian but they're not worried about the christians at that stage it's not a hostile thing that's why redwell was able to put another altar to christ in his pagan temple he you know he he didn't see there was anything wrong with that so hostility is a different thing intellectual belief intellectual curiosity is a great thing and the pagans had it in spades um we haven't got time to go into it but but there's some wonderful stories of how they've got uh, fines from all over europe they've got fines from all, they've got fines from the middle east they went to they went to the middle east to get bitumen you know that's what they did and uh, they followed the same kind of areas as later were followed by the early anglian monks people like willibald and so on so yes i'm quite convinced that uh, that they are pagan but yeah. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating and i'm so glad you mentioned the bitumen from syria because that's my single most favorite find yeah. from the excavations i, I just i yeah. love i love what that says about the people um so another really popular question that lots of people have been asking about including nikki um is just to expand a little bit more on some of the prehistory and what you think going on there and what's what's been coming up what what's come up already and what do you what else do you think might be there Yes, I apologise. I, I realised my prehistoric side was a casualty of, of, the, of the filtering process. <laughs> yes, it's um, basically in the Neolithic period, there are pits, um, uh, tree pits and pits with lots of pottery in. Uh, that's a, quite a common find in the Neolithic period. In the late bron uh, early Bronze Age, they dig enormous ditches going in straight lines, not necessarily following the contours, but dividing up the territory. So that uh, early Bronze Age beaker period, if you will, is a good, uh, a, a good period for, let's say, a major development operation. And same thing they found at Flag Fen and so on. So it's uh, uh, really, really satisfying. Uh, and then uh, they built palisades uh, for animals uh, in the later Bronze Age. In the Iron Age, they built um, uh, what used to be called Celtic fields, uh, Madeleine calls them bocage, which is what they have in Celtic France, uh, little square paddocks really. And those were the ones that survived uh, into the seventh century AD uh, when they built the mounds and put the mounds on the, on the corners. Uh, the the, the prehistory is very well written up by Madeleine and it's in the book on Sutton Who, the, the big research report. And that research report is uh, is on open access, free to everybody. You just have to uh, find it. It's actually on my website because I gave up waiting for everybody else to put it on open access. I put it on myself um, and you can um, uh, read it, download it. And the prehistory chapter, it's about 60 pages and it's pretty thorough, pretty interesting. Lots of flints. <laughs> Everyone just to it. let everybody know, sorry to interrupt my, but just let everyone know that we've just popped the link to Martin's website in the publications page in the chat, and we will follow up the talk tonight with links to everything else for, for those of you who have questions that might not make the Q&A session. Yeah, we are going to try and take uh, a couple more questions, and then we do also have, for those of you that stick around, a really, really big and exciting new announcement. So do, do stick around for the questions, not just because they're interesting, but because there's something just as interesting coming as well. <laughs> Um, there's a good little question that's just come in from someone called Warrior Lady, uh, who wants to know if you think the mounds were positioned randomly or if they might have been related to things that were already there. I think they were related to the prehistoric landscape. Uh, I think they could see those fields and decided to put their mounds on them to show that we are the new landowners. Remember, the mounds arrive in um, at, at different times. They're not all built at the same time, obviously. So the, the first three are cremations in bronze bowls, five, six, and seven. They, I think they arrive first. They're placed on the fields. Uh, and then they develop in the way I, I, I tried to explain um, with the horse, horse and rider grave and then the two ship burials. And then finally, um, the uh, woman's burial of, of Mound 14 
uh, this was very battered, I have to admit, uh, and it, it was extremely hard to excavate and only produced tiny little fragments. But those tiny little fragments were of silver and they were silver buckles and silver chatelaine, the sort of thing you hang from your belt, a sign of, a, of an alpha woman. And uh, that's why I, I have a, a feeling that this is a person of, of enormous importance who must have designed Radwell's burial, assuming that he was, uh, she was the queen. That all fits quite nicely. I can't prove it, but I think that's, a, that's quite a nice feeling. So yes, I think the, um, the way that the mounds were arrived were, were, were quite important. And the queen's burial was, was a sort of outlier. It was, it was heading inland, if you see what I mean. So that's another reason for thinking it was the last one. And then nothing, nothing. It became, it was abandoned round about the middle of the, eight, of the, of the seventh century. And then uh, within the next 50 years, uh, they started using it as an execution place. Yeah. Fascinating. There are also, there's quite a few questions as well um, from people who seem quite fascinated by the area, maybe just outside of where you were excavating, where the earlier excavations uh, were happening. Are there, what kind of signs are there that there might be stuff in a, in a larger area? Well, um, it, plenty of signs that the prehistory covered the whole ridge overlooking the Deben. That's not a problem. It was all in the surface, all been ploughed up, lots of finds of flints and pottery and so on. <clears throat> we looked hard to see whether there were any burials um, outside the um, schedule area, if you like, the, 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 the fenced area with, which contained the mounds. We dug trenches 100 metres long uh, to see whether we, that's how we found the executions incidentally, uh, by digging those trenches. There was a sort of hint of a mound on the north side, uh, one of those sort of discolorations in the in the in the vegetation. Possibly, possibly. I think if you want to dig another mound, don't recommend it. But if you do want to dig another mound, I think there might be one there. Um, I doubt whether it would be any in any different state, uh, you know. But on the other hand, who knows? Um, going further north. Um, in the area that's now owned by the National Trust, as well as their mounds, they own that, they own the whole estate. And so by the Sutton Hoo uh, um, Visitor Centre, just north of there, there's a field which seemed to have some mounds in it uh, on a map, uh, Norden's map for the 17th century. And I think they did have mounds in them. They're, they're actually prefigured as, as rabbit warrens, but I think they were mounds originally. So I think it is possible that they went on up there. On the other hand, they could be part of the, um, of the, of, of the family cemetery of the sixth century. So who can, who can say, but it's worth exploring. It, it hasn't stopped yet. Yeah. So on that note, again, there's, there's quite a few questions about this. So you just said you didn't necessarily really want to dig another mound, but what would you still like to find out about the site? And what are some of the biggest outstanding research questions for Anglo-Saxon studies focused on Sutton Hoof? And that was a question from Roy M. Carroll. Well, what a question. Yes, I think there's a lot to find out. The site itself is a burial site and uh, that uh, has shown itself capable of telling us a tremendous amount about certain individuals and their day, that's true. However, I think in archaeology, life comes first, life, life is, comes before death, life is the thing to look for, and what we really need is some more settlements, and I think the person who's looking for them at the moment is Chris Scarlett at Rendlesham. Uh, that's a terrific uh, project that's going ahead. Reynolds Shimbi was known about, of course, because it's mentioned in uh, Bede. Uh, it, it had a church there. Uh, it's where Redwell's temple was, as well as the a church of St. Gregory. So there are lots of pointers. It's really rich. Suffolk is very rich. It, it was in the seventh century. Very, very rich indeed. So it's a very special area. Uh, a community which is well off, probably from farming, um, is uh, developed, uh, the aristocracy developed their kingdom um, and then Christianized it with churches at Bury St Edmunds and so forth. 
but stayed there, stayed at the top of the market. You know, I think there's plenty there. It's got a professional unit still, uh, one of the very few places in the country that has, uh, employed by the county council. And they're working at Rendlesham. So they are, they're doing a lot. Sutton who continues to attract huge numbers of visitors. So the archeology span of Suffolk is a good place to be, very good place to be. And I think a lot will be discovered. We're looking at social structure. We're looking at ideology. We're looking at all sorts of things which have come onto the archeological agenda, uh, not just since 1939, but you know, since we finished in 2005. Lots of new questions. That speaks perfectly to, to a lot of what you were saying and what this talk is really about is you know how how our understanding or how our interests change and what we try and find out changes over time. And quite a few people have also asked, given that um, you know technology has changed so much in the time that you were digging and since then, and also so has the co social context changed and the kinds of questions that we want to ask about the site. Is there anything you would have done differently? If you could go back now and do the dig again, is there a different question you would ask of your dig? Or is there a different technique you would use that wasn't available at the time? Yes, if I was doing it now, I mean, if I was going back in time and starting, I wouldn't do anything different, but clearly, but, but doing it now, yes, I would. I would be much more careful of, of um, disturbing anything. On the other hand, I would like to know what had been disturbed. Um, I, I was quite... In, enthralled by seeing the uh, different patterns of uh, the soil that was used to make up mounds uh, and the sort of pattern that was on the bottom of the mound two chamber. I'd like something that that told me about that so that we could discover what was reasonably intact now and also protected. Uh, I think we could use a really battered mound uh, to develop new techniques to tell one context from another context. Uh, but the ones that were, 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 were untampered with, they haven't been really dug into since the, let's say the seventh, eighth century, then I'd like to see them um, uh, very carefully controlled and one day maybe opened with all the techniques if there was a question, but there'd have to be a new question. And maybe I'm not the right person to ask that new question. I think somewhere in the in the student bodies or in dig venture there are young people who've got lots of interesting new questions to ask. Uh, they're the ones to set the agenda really. I think that is uh, yeah, a very good point and we'd obviously love to hear from people in the chat as well if there's any other you know if there, what questions would you ask if if you could dig at Sutton Hoo again. But in the meantime, um, there's just two more questions that I want to ask. Um, first of all, what has um, me metallurgical forensic techniques revealed? Have they revealed anything particularly exciting and interesting that we haven't heard about yet? Well, I think the, the only one I know most recently is the, is the, is the um, HS2 survey, the XRF um, uh, survey that's been done there. And I don't know that much about it. I mean, I just, uh, uh, I've just been told by someone that, uh, uh, that it's been a great success and that they've got a map of anomalies based on uh, um, metallic compounds. And so some of those are obviously be areas that um, uh, of, of uh, let's say industrial waste or whatever. So that's fine. We know, we know where those are now uh, and others, you know, according to, I was going to say my friend, it's actually my son, according to my son who works on HS2, uh, according to him, he, they, they can even find Mesolithic sites uh, using this, even though uh, we're not quite sure what it's, what it's picking up. But, it, you know, it, there are stranger things going on than we know. Metal detectors, for example, they've, they've found pottery as well as metal. So uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. I'm I'm a great believer in using these instruments as much as possible. And so uh, lots so lots of news still to come from what's already been found, which is yes. And and um, think about think about the portable antiquity scheme. You know that's mapping what didn't exist when we were at Sutton. It's mapping the whole of the country. Very very interestingly, all sorts of things are, are cropping up there. So we just Martin, I've just um, I've just had a message from our director of excavations at Lindisfarne, who's watching, 
at home saying we are definitely having that portable XRF at Linda's farm this year. So you've converted him like instantly. <laughs> well, if you've got a portable one, they they are they, they, you can be very annoying with them. I, I've seen somebody in action with one of these things at a party uh, looking at pieces of jewelry and pointing it at and saying, oh dear, oh dear, and then moving on. <laughs> so yes, anyway. Good. There's still so, so many questions, and I'm afraid we're not going to have time to answer them all, but we will try and make a note of some of them and uh, maybe follow up with you afterwards and add them um, add them to the recording and the links that we send out to everyone to follow up with afterwards. But just one last little question before we move on to our big, big announcement, yeah. and that is, did you watch the movie and what did you think of it? What was your reaction to it? I did watch the movie and I was consulted about it uh, in, in the early days. and. Uh, I thought that I, I had reservations in the, in the early days, uh, uh, in fact, very early days, because John Preston invited me to tea and uh, said that he was writing this book and I gave him lots of stuff. So I was trying to be as helpful as possible. Um, I thought the, uh, I started to, um, yeah, I was, I was having a, a, a consultation with the director and said what I thought about, uh, and I hoped they'd work in in uh, do the do the filming at Sutton Hoo, which it turned out to be what they didn't do. And I thought it, actually it was a very good decision because if they filmed at Sutton Hoo, they would have seen uh, the whole thing would be surrounded by uh, uh, cash crops. Whereas going to uh, where they did go in Surrey, uh, it was a heathland, so they knew what they were doing. Um, and then I got uh, into a correspondence with uh, Rafe Fines, uh, who wanted to know a bit more about Basil Brown and so on. A really intelligent chap, um, brilliant actor, but also one who really were, obviously works at his, at his part uh, very carefully. And that was very interesting. And his, his idea is also really, really interesting. He has an archaeologist half-brother, or foster brother, do I mean, yes. So he, he was very sympathetic to our profession and also I thought the film was champion. I did think it was made, as a matter of fact, I think it was made by him uh, and, uh, and Carrie Mulligan. I thought they were terrific, you know. And I, and I think the way that they acted, I don't know, it was almost like Chekhov, you know, it was like a really a, an end of sort of a, a, a break in civilization, uh, war coming, so on, just as like they, they made it beautifully sort of sepia tinted, the whole thing, all the conversation. Uh, so I thought they were wonderful and I thought they got something across that in many ways uh, was quite new to me. Yeah, it was very atmospheric, it certainly. Was good. And uh, I think one of my personal favorite moments from it um, was when Basil runs out to cover the site over when it's raining and it's pouring with rain and he's worried about the site and he rushes yeah. out of bed grabs a canvas and I think as archaeologists we can all really relate to that yeah, moment. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Martin, did it make you miss digging? <laughs> yeah. Well, not really, because I think that that sort of digging where you dig a trench and it falls in on you is not really my scene, you know, <laughs> anymore. Might be once. So I think that's the perfect note to, to finish on. Um, we obviously all absolutely love hearing about archaeology. It's fantastic to dig deeper into the story of the dig and the archaeology behind it. We love hearing about it. We love watching it. And on that note, I think it is time for our really big and really special announcement. I'm so glad that there are so many of you here. Um, over the last few years, loads and loads of people have been asking us when are we going to make a series? When are we going to have a series that is really about proper archaeology, proper archaeology on the screen with dig ventures um, in it? And I am really, really delighted to announce that it's finally actually happening. Yes, we have a brand new docu-series coming out that features dig ventures archaeologists. It is filmed on our digs. It is packed full of real archaeology and it is going to be archaeology as you have never seen it before. Right now, it is still being edited. The whole thing is being supported by our subscribers and we would love a little bit of extra help from you guys in getting it finished. 
So if you'd like to become a subscriber and help us get it finished, that would be fantastic. We are going to have it available for everyone to watch. You don't have to be a subscriber to watch it, but it's your support that will help us get it finished um, and ready and out and aired and online this summer. So just to give you a little feel of what it's like, uh, we've put together a trailer. Um, we're getting ready to play it. I know that Ginny is queuing it up in the background. But if you do become a subscriber and decide to help us get this, this docu-series finished, we are actually going to have a special screening on the 28th of May, where we're going to be watching episode one together with the whole production team. And it's going to be really, really exciting. Uh, I really can't wait. So much time and effort has gone into this. So many archaeological discoveries have happened while it's been made. And it's really going to be a chance to see archaeology as you've never seen it before. Our take on it is basically that it is archaeology for the Netflix generation. So, Ginny, are you ready? Have you got the trailer lined up? Yes. It's a real deal. We've now got quite a nice little assemblage of these things. So there we go. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the trailer. I get shivers from watching it. I just love seeing what's happened over the last year, all captured in just a minute. If you've enjoyed it, um, have a think about whether, whether you want to become a subscriber or just wait until it comes out this summer. Tell your friends, tell everyone there is an amazing, an amazing new docu-series about archaeology on its way. I really, really cannot wait. Um, so thank you all for being here so, so much. We've had an amazing event. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Ginny. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to everyone who's come from so many different places around the world. It has been amazing. Um, as well as the docu-series that's coming up, there is always with the adventures loads 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 more coming up um, after this event we're going to send you an email that has all of the links to the recording to martin's publications to more information that you can actually continue your journey digging deeper into the story of sun who but you can also have a look at our website and see what other events are coming up um, we've got a couple of new digs coming up this season that you can join in with and actually stop just watching but actually have a go and do it yourself um, make sure that you're following us on social media um, and maybe even try signing up to e our email list if you haven't already because that's where we always announce what's coming up uh, first so thank you so much to everyone who has joined us i hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have i can barely get my words out i'm so excited about everything um, and i know that i'm definitely going to be heading off to use that discount code for martin's book straight after this event um, we'll share that with you as i said in emails lisa do you have any final words that you want to i say? really i martin is still here with us and i just wanted to say thank you again martin for for your time it has been absolutely brilliant and um, you know, maybe we'll have to have him back. There's still so many questions to answer, but thank you, Martin, and thank you everyone for coming. Ask me. Thank you all for coming. It's been it's been great. And congratulations on your new series. Good luck with it. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.